today we come to the restoration of the soul. He restores my soul. That almost sounds too good to be true. We can actually start all over again? That seems to be what it is aiming at. Think of it this way. Have you ever looked at your life like it were a worthless piece of wood ready to be discarded or thrown on the fire? Well, in the hands of a craftsman, that same piece of wood can be turned into a beautiful piece of art, the way it's done here in the workshop of Mundar in the old city of Nazareth. All over this place, he's got wonderful creations out of that which was considered disposable. Look at this chair I'm sitting on, for example. Um, another fine piece of work, and there he is in the back making um, other creations. And let's just take a look over on the table here as candle holders and other pieces of work that are in progress, giving us beauty and utility from that which was ready to be thrown away. Now, let's go to one larger, grander scale of restoration. As we see here, an archeological ruin that is being restored piece by piece. It suggests to us what it might be like when God puts back together and restores a life that is in disarray and hopelessly broken. And that's what God can do in our lives. He restores my soul, but it involves two key ingredients, honesty and healing. First, let's be honest. When we get bad news, such as a diagnosis of cancer, aren't we inclined to ask, why me? What did I do to deserve this? But those are usually the wrong questions to ask, and even more so when they're used to judge someone else. Jesus made this so clear. One time, Jesus and his disciples came by a blind man on the way. The disciples asked the common question, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus turned it totally upside down and said, neither one. This man is very special. He's one in whom God is going to show his glory. And Jesus went and healed him. So, it's not our place to judge others, and if you have cancer, it doesn't help to divert your precious energy trying to place the blame for your own situation. At the same time, we need to recognize that our sins, our sickness of soul, our emotional baggage and damage that we've carried since childhood are gonna have continuing effects on us, effects on our minds, our bodies, even our souls. So when we're afflicted, it becomes one of those rare opportunities to take a look and realize some of the things we don't usually take time for. Through that honesty, we can move toward restoration of soul and healing. And David sure knows what he's talking about when he says he restores my soul. Do you remember the time he was in his palace high up over Jerusalem where from his vantage point he could look down over the housetops across the city? David saw a beautiful woman named Bathsheba. She was bathing. He can't take his eyes off of her. David would like to meet this lady. He's the king, so when he sends for her, she comes. That night, David got her pregnant. Her husband, Uriah the Hittite, meanwhile, is away as a soldier in David's army. So David goes through an elaborate cover-up plan so that he's not going to be suspected as the father. His plan doesn't work, so David conspires to send Uriah to the front lines of battle, so he'll be one of the first to be killed. The prophet Nathan brings a severe word of judgment against David to expose this sin. You recall the story of the rich man and the poor man that we reviewed in an earlier segment. When he heard this story, David crumbled before the prophet's judgment, and he sincerely repented before God. He faced, of his, he faced his sins, and he spoke of the gruesome effects of his cover-up. David said, My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester and are loathsome because of my sinful folly. I am bowed down and brought very low. All day long I go about groaning. And then in Psalm 51, For I know my transgressions, 
and my sin is always before me. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And David was forgiven. He was cleansed, his soul restored, and we will find that maybe our sins aren't of the same magnitude as David's, but to be sure, we all have our sins, no matter how secret or respectable, and God invites us to come, confess to him, seek his forgiveness, and receive his restoration. Now, restoration is not a one-time thing. It happens over and over. And for some of us, restoration can only come when we're ready to forgive the hurt and resentments that we are holding against other people. The Lord's Prayer reminds us that we find forgiveness as we're willing to extend forgiveness. Now, this is somewhat ironic, but we also find that the older we get, and the closer we draw to God, the more we need to confess to God. Now, I don't think this is because we're getting worse and worse. I think it's actually the reverse. The closer we get to God, the more we realize just how deep is the defacement of the image of God that we bear. And as we get to know his kindness and his forgiveness, we learn to trust him. We find that there's a new courage to face the true state of our souls and to discover even greater depths of what it means to have our souls forgiven and restored. As we hear these words of the psalm, I know we might instinctively wish that the words were, he restores my body, instead of he restores my soul. But the wonderful secret is this. In restoring the soul, the body is inevitably affected. For some, they might find complete healing. For others, they will receive the strength to cope. And for still others, are going to find peace to see that maybe it's time to let go, release this battered bodily garment, and exchange it for a new set of clothes. Whatever. The scripture teaches that our physical is going to be replaced in the life to come. The priority now is the restoration of our souls so that we're prepared to receive it. Mm -hmm.